All right. Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, uh, the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. I'm kind of going off script a little bit for this one, so I'm I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to say. <laughs> but today I'm talking to, well, not today, in November, or I think it was November, a few months ago, <laughs> I uh, talked to uh, Budrino, uh, formerly of the Badrino Politics streaming and podcast. He does not do uh, politics streaming anymore, so you cannot find his content, but I still think that this is worth putting out, and this was a, a good conversation about a variety of topics. At one point, I think somebody asked us about Alex Stein, um, who I did not realize, it turns out, is actually like a uh, right-wing troll. So... Uh, the person who asked about Alex Stein or what we thought of Alex Stein, I currently think very lowly of this person. Uh, I think his name was Alex Stein. I keep saying that, but I'm not entirely certain what, if that's the name. But he went to a, uh, a drag story time, a drag queen story time, and uh, was harassing people, uh, annoying people in the in the line, or maybe maybe it was some of the defenders. I'll include, well, no, maybe I won't include one of the stories in the links. He's a very annoying person. Not not an actual thinker at all, just a troll. A uh, professional troll, much like, much, much like most right-wing uh, media personalities. They're just trolling for clout. And, and that's the whole game for them. I guess that's about all I have to say about this interview, except that it, I really like uh, Badrino's uh, takes on some things but then i disagree with them quite a bit on other things so so take that with you as you will and i hope you enjoy this conversation because i certainly did and uh yeah i guess that's all i gotta say about the interview on to the pitch um my family and i are moving so production is going to be even less steady than it has been in a while i hope that's okay with some of you uh i, I hope that's okay with my supporters i'm working on uh a, getting content out as fast as I can with everything that's going on, plus having kids and moving kids and work and, and uh, it's, it's quite a lot. But now is a better time to support this show than any because I just, my rent just went up by $700 a month. <laughs> so definitely could use the help. Um, that's patreon.com slash skeptical leftist. And obviously I have to thank all of my patrons um, including uh, Felicia, who increased her pledge recently. All of you make it possible for me to do this show. Uh, support levels on Patreon uh, start at $1 per month or $1.50 for Canadians. Uh, I'm not sure how that translates into pounds or, or whatever currency, euros, whatever currency you happen to be if you're not from North America. If you cannot support me with money, then please hit the like button. Uh, and go and write a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. Uh, I always need more ratings and reviews, so make sure to check out the links in the show notes for that. And then make sure to subscribe on YouTube or in the podcast app of your choice so that you get a new episodes as soon as they come out. Uh, you can always contact me on social media or leave a comment on YouTube, or you can contact me on my website, skepticalleftist.com, or you can email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much, and on to the interview. All right, hi and welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm joined by, how is it, Bud Reno or Budrino? <laughs> it's however you want to say it. I usually say Budrino. It, it's... It's up to you. Um, I want to pronounce it. To be in honest, in my head, it was always put Badrino. So, <laughs> <laughs> and you're mainly from uh, uh, Badrino Politics podcast and Twitch stream. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how long have you been doing that? Uh, I, I, I think I started podcasting two years ago. Uh, I haven't done that in a bit. I kind of switched to the streaming more recently. But yeah, I started the podcast probably about two years ago. And then before that, um, I did more like memes and videos and stuff. Okay. And I guess uh, maybe we should find out a little bit about yourself. Like what's your, your background? What got you into politics and all that? 
Well, for me, I was always into politics. Like even as a kid, um, I was always, I always paid attention to politics. So I, when I was a kid, I watched comedy shows like Rick Mercer and this hour is 22 minutes. That stuff kind of got me into politics when I was young. Okay. And, uh, even when I was young, I always kind of liked, um, like left wing political theory and stuff like that. Cool. And, uh, yeah, then I got older. I got into content creation, I think, when I was in university. Um, and I I, uh, I did a degree in political science, but that's not, I, I don't know how that's, it's not super related. I guess the political theory part's related. Right. I did take a lot of political theory um, and stuff like that. Okay. But uh, yeah, I was always very like political and involved in politics. Okay. And um so you volunteered with like uh, political campaigns and whatnot or organizing uh, in other senses? I've done a little bit of partisan stuff, but I've always done more so like, um, well, I guess the term now would be like mutual aid, like more okay. stuff like that, more stuff like um, uh, education and things like that. I've never been a huge partisan guy. If the right opportunity comes, sometimes I've helped some people out that I like know well and that I trust, but right, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was never really like a, even when I was younger, I was never really a big partisan guy. It's hard to pick a team when they all suck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you don't want to be, I always found you could, you know, if I'm going to spend 10 hours doing something, I'm better off doing something 10 hours in the community than doing 10 hours of calling for donations for a political party or something. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, I donated to the NDP a couple of times years ago and, uh, I still get emails and calls every time they need money <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. okay, but I don't like actually like you guys. <laughs> yeah. It never ends. <laughs> you're just slight, you're just better than the Saskatchewan party. <laughs> <laughs> but so, uh, what kind of stuff do you cover on uh, your stream? Just general politics or do you often go in on a specific topic? It kind of depends what's going on. Sometimes I'll pick a specific topic. Um, I cover elections, but that's usually because a lot of the people who view my content are more like casual political viewers. Oh, okay. So a lot of people... Like most people watch my stuff when it's, um, if I do an election, that's when I'll get the most views. Oh yeah. But then usually after that, some of those people obviously will kind of stay and get more educated. So election coverage, I just try to give like analysis predictions and like, um, what the consequences of an election will be. But after that though, in my normal streams, I usually, uh, look at things in the news and then kind of relate that to like just left-wing political stuff in general. Uh, whenever there's like a big news event and things like that, um, I'll try and like link it to left-wing political ideology and stuff. Very cool. So uh, what is what is your take on the current Canadian political landscape? <laughs> I would say it's miserable. Like if, if, I, if I looked at Canada Sorry. and if I were to just look at the way things are, I would say it's pretty miserable. And I think especially in the last few years, when you look at um, like people who are relatively left wing trying to become a part of the NDP or the Greens at different levels, and then just getting the party establishment just crushing any kind of even like social democratic yeah. um, push within the party. I think seeing that in every province and like at the federal level, too, I think that... Um, it's it's been pretty miserable. It's depressing. Um, yeah, like yeah. I think there there might be some hope. There might be some ways. I I do think there are some like okay MPs who are definitely better than their like rest. But right. I think that's one thing. I think a lot of people have learned, regardless of who they are, that uh, the political establishment and all the parties they always stand for neoliberalism, regardless of what the party says, they're always going to do what's in their best interest. And they're not going to make fundamental change in a country like Canada. Yeah. Like even, even like a, uh, a very mild attempt at a wealth tax gets shut down so fast. Like you can't even blink before it's exactly. <laughs> rejected. So yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a good way, I guess, to uh, make people not, really be invested in the political system 
but to take care, I guess, build community, take care of ourselves. I kind yeah. of preach that all the time. So. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so uh, you're located in Ontario or be or somewhere? Out now east? I'm in Sudbury. I used to be in Ottawa for uh, like five years, but I okay. just recently moved to Sudbury like a couple months ago. And, and do, what's the local scene there like? I'm pretty new here, so I don't know a ton, but it's it's a very different. Um, are you familiar with Sudbury? Not a whole Ontario. Lot, no. So it's yeah, it's like a smaller town in in northern Ontario for, for especially for viewers who won't who wouldn't know that. Um, I think it's got around 150 thousand people. So here, the culture I would say is very different politically. Like when we look at um, the Ontario uh, strike uh, with Cupe recently, the um, the people in schools, the janitors, EAs, ECEs. Mm. It's very interesting here because when I went to that um, picket line, a lot of people supported the strike. Okay. And it's a, I would say it's a different political culture than what I'm used to. I grew up in um, southern Ontario in a town about an hour away from Toronto. Okay. But compared to a city like Ottawa, where I feel like um, – I would say Ottawa is not as pro union. I think Sudbury as a city, the culture here, the movements here tend to be a bit more like blue collar and like union oriented. Okay. Okay. Um, now of course that sometimes comes along with like some social conservatism and stuff like that. Right. Right. But at the same time though, you know, when I looked at the amount of people who were supporting the striking workers, whether it was like bus drivers, garbage truck, uh, you know, teachers, all the people who came by and showed support. It was a good sense of solidarity. I think that um, right I would say like this city does have, it reminds me of um, in some ways it kind of reminds me of cities like Hamilton or Cambridge, these other cities in Ontario where they, it's almost like uh, uh, the Midwest in the States, like these post industrial cities where they used to have a lot of factory jobs. And then now those jobs have been, sent away with NAFTA and you're kind of left with a lot more service jobs. And these cities aren't as prosperous like Detroit. They're not right. as prosperous as they used to be um, when they had a stronger manufacturing sector here. Right. Right. That makes sense. I, uh, I always think of Ontario as like, uh, like I have no idea what the industries over there are. It always seems like Toronto, right? Yeah. So you've got the business sector and what else is over there? <laughs> I know. The thing I would say about Sudbury is it's um I'd say it's kind of different than the rest of Ontario when I think about it. Like I would say it's more similar to other parts of Canada. Um cuz Sudbury is I think about 5 hours north of Toronto. So it's it's pretty far north. Right. Yeah. Um and just the way the culture, the industries, the jobs, things are here compared to how Toronto's just so like, you know, financial sector. I would say like it it almost does feel like you're in a different province. Right. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So it's, I'd say it's pretty interesting with that. Um, I suppose yeah. it, it's, it's almost like anywhere, right? Where the, you have the rural and urban divide yeah. and like exactly. yeah, the finance or financial stuff is always in the cities. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, here uh, we don't have a very strong union uh, kind of push these days. Everybody, yeah everybody's so reliant on the energy sector. So, uh, it's very like oil industry. Yeah. We're always pro oil and anti-union. It's very, de <laughs> very depressing. Okay. I think you have, you have roots though, right? Like historic roots in yeah. Saskatchewan of like labor and things like that. Right. Yeah, for sure. There's a, there's a, a lot of people actually looking into like the reasons for the, the shift over the, uh, past 20 years or whatever. Yeah. Cause it's, it's been a pretty dramatic shift actually, but I'm not an expert in that by any stretch. <laughs> I just know my day to day. Right. And the yeah. guys that I work alongside, uh, quite often you have to be very careful about even mentioning unions or being pro union or you yeah. know, stuff like that. So, yeah. So, uh, so I guess besides, uh, your content creation, what do you do, uh, for a work? Well, I would, I'll say, I don't want to go in too much into my newer job that, but yeah. I would say in my past, I did a lot of blue collar work. So okay. actually I never, um, I never really worked, um, a white collar job before. 
So in my past, I worked in like masonry, construction, um, landscaping. I worked in warehouses, car factories. And I, I moved a lot because every year with school and stuff like that, um, I usually had to move in the summers and things like that. So I worked in a lot of different industries and um, in Southern Ontario and around Ottawa. And uh, I think the interesting thing about that is, um, you know, when I look at those jobs and those people I worked with and how so many of those people, like, they might, they might vote conservative or they might, they might like, they voted for Doug Ford. They, they might've right. voted for Stephen Harper, but so many of them like economically have very left-wing opinions. Like one of the examples I always give is when I worked on a, a factory line, uh, this was when Doug Ford was just about to win for his first time. So this was like, I don't know, four years ago. Okay. And I remember the people I was working with on the factory line, they were pissed off because for the family picnic, at the fa car factory, uh, you had to pay to go. The company didn't even cover it for you. Oh, yeah. No, that would piss me off, too. <laughs> so all these people, and then it started a conversation about how the owners screwed all the workers over, and they were pissed because they weren't getting a raise that year. And right. I was just there for the summer. But the really interesting part, though, is like m most of those people were hardcore Doug Ford voters. Right. But if I brought up the idea of like, a cooperative, I didn't call it cooperative, but if I just, I brought up the idea of if all of us could own a portion of this, or if the company could let us have a small stake in it right. and how that would change things. They all supported that. Like they yeah. weren't, you know, although they might've voted conservative, they weren't like Adam Smith type capitalists who right. were like, yeah. you know, hardcore, um, you know, or like, like uh, Von Hayek, that kind of stuff. Like, most of them just kind of voted conservative because they were sick of the liberals or whatever. Right. So I think when I look at my work history and, and the p different places I've worked throughout my life, um, I think that's one thing I've definitely taken away from all that stuff is that there's a lot of people who are so close to being on the brink of becoming left wing and that kind of stuff, or they have a lot of left wing opinions. They just don't know left wing people or they're not connected to the community or they have uh, preconceived notions. Yeah, about you can't it use or... the word communist. Like you definitely... exactly, yeah, exactly. You can't, you can't say that stuff. But then it's so funny though because so many of those people, like everything they're complaining about, low wages, all the things that they're complaining about, um, it all connects to Marx. It all connects to like left wing political theory um, yeah. and labor rights and all that kind of stuff too. Like, even same thing. Um, even here in Sudbury, when I've seen people talk about. Uh, things like universal basic income or increasing disability and stuff like a lot of people really support that. Is that right? Wow. Yeah. Like, and like, um, I was kind of surprised to some degree, especially here too in Sudbury people, um, a lot of people are very like pro indigenous rights. So I've seen a lot of, um, nice. those signs about the, uh, residential school, uh, that, that stuff. But even people here, even if they're like conservative, a lot of them still, will now they won't call it like um like land back or they, they might use different words right, right but a lot of people here though still because a lot of the people here i find there's a higher indigenous population here than the rest of ontario so a lot of people have like a distant family member or they they at least know someone who's indigenous right right so that's another thing too that like i've seen through here that like there's a lot of people who support um like making amends with indigenous people, like focusing okay. on like making up for what happened before. And that's pretty, that's pretty something that I never really saw in a city like Ottawa or in um, Southern that's, Ontario. That's awesome. Like uh, yeah. that's, it's, uh, we have a, in general, I would say Saskatchewan has a, a decent uh, size uh, indigenous population, but instead of like, I don't know, maybe it's just my, my particular, per, uh, what I've experienced, but I've seen more people who are like, Oh, why is it such a big deal? Why are we worried about it? Blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Like kind of more in the, the racist camp. <laughs> yeah. Than the yeah. I've definitely <laughs> seen some, some of those people too. Yeah. That seems like, that seems like the, the majority that I see. Uh, it's funny, like the way that certain people that are, like you say, conservative, they have like various left wing ish ideas. Like, uh, I can't talk about defund the police, but everybody I know hates the cops. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, so it's like, there's like a, a almost a, a split in their brain where they're like, yeah, I hate the cops, but 
we got to have them, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's weird. But uh, I guess thinking about like uh, universal basic income, I don't know if I know of that many people who would be in support of that around here. We've got a lot of like the the meritocracy type people who really yeah. believe that, yeah. Like, well, I, I worked rigs and that's how I made my money. And now I'm, I moved up in the rig and, and whatnot. Yeah. And, and p- yeah, people change quick. Yeah. So, so that the, but I mean, it's, fu- it's also funny. I think like to think like uh, many of my coworkers, like we all know that our boss sucks. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but then, but then they'll talk about uh, supporting conservative party and I'll be like, well, they're not that they're not better than the liberals in, in how they give our boss extra stuff and they don't, you know, do anything for us. Like those yeah. teams are the same in my book. And they'll be like, ah, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck Trudeau. <laughs> yeah. yeah that, that, oh yeah. That. <laughs> <laughs> I hope, I hope Polly ever wins. And I'm like, oh yeah. God, I hope not. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's kind of uh, like working alongside people with different politics is I think a really good, a good thing in general. Like I know online, I can be pretty hard line about things, but when you have to deal with people in person, you have to be like, okay, yeah, I get where you're coming from. You have to be yeah. a lot more nuanced about your perspective. So it's really good to work alongside people of like that. Definitely. So I guess, um, uh, you took political science, but you worked in blue collar. So <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> you just uh, didn't really, I guess, there, is there jobs in political science? Is that a thing that exists? Yes, but there is a lot of nepotism. Oh, so for right? me, it was complicated because I was a first generation student. Um, uh, so it was all very new to me. And I moved very far. I moved six hours away from home to go to university. So that was a very, you know, to me, it was just normal because they said, oh, like the school has a good program. You should my guidance counselors and stuff. But when I look back, I'm like, that was very difficult. The thing with political science is um, there is jobs, especially with government. Uh, There is jobs in it. It's not, it's kind of like an average degree, I would say, but so much of it in Canada is dependent on, um, there's so much nepotism. Like when I would Mm -hmm. go to class and I'd be working with kids who their parents donated to the conservative party. So then that's how they became a constituent constituate oh my god constituency uh assistant uh they got those like jobs so there's a lot of um like not surprisingly but even within the public sector i'd say like there's still um it's very hard to get into that being an outsider if you don't have any connections or you don't so many people i went to school with their parents had worked for the government for like three or four generations or something oh geez wow yeah so, so I, then I, they got an in and <laughs> you're like, ah, fuck. Exactly. <laughs> so like there, a lot of people go into political science to do law. Um, okay. So originally that's kind of what I was considering, but now I'm like, there's, I'm not spending 200 grand to do right. something like that. But so a lot of people I did know, they did political science and then they went into law afterwards or they did a master's or tried to do a phd or whatever and then go into teaching there's not you 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 only you basically have to become a professor there's no you can't really become like a public school teacher um yeah it's not uh useful as an education degree type thing yeah like um in the states it's a bit better with that um but here it's but yeah so like a lot of people tend to go into law or they go into like academia and then the rest of the people tend to go into government I guess a very small amount tend to go into like finance, but, and then also another huge chunk go into like partisan politics and work for um, people and stuff like that. For me, it was just more so um, it was very hard to get jobs. Like I applied to, I tried to work for political parties. I tried to work with that stuff, but you gotta, they gotta know you very well for years. You gotta volunteer with them for years. They won't just hire an outside person to, Uh, they won't trust an outside person with um, all the information and stuff like that. Um, I I guess I suppose I can understand that, but also it's like, that's pretty, pretty weird. That doesn't leave a lot of opportunities for people who are new. Well, that's what always happens with a party like the NDP. When I look at their communication strategy and things like that, it, if you always choose your friends, it's always going to be very biased, which you end up like have what what ends up, 
like you end up with a result that's always very biased towards you. So, um, yeah, like if, if anyone's ever, if anyone listening's ever considered a political science degree or something like that, I don't know if I would, you, you really have to have a clear career goal. Um, and you, you also have to see, that's my problem with it. That's why I work so many blue collar jobs is it took me a long time to find out the different processes because they don't post all that stuff everywhere. You have to go onto like very specific websites oh, to find right? placements. And it's just uh, not all on LinkedIn or job. Yeah. It's not, or whatever. yeah, it's, it's a very, um, like an example would be the federal student work exchange program. I didn't even know about it until my fourth year oh, okay. because, um, it tends to be a lot of people who their, their parents are, you know, public servants and then their kids, they, pass that information on. So it's not, it's something that's very hard to um, get into, but I guess that's a big thing with any social science degree though. It's, it's, it's not, you got to kind of do a co-op or a placement or something. It's very hard to get a job right out of one of those degrees. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. I guess uh, these days it seems like it's hard to get a good job anywhere, but yeah, (laughs) but uh, yeah, it's, that's tough. I mean, it, it's hard to have an interest in something and actually study it in university and be like, yeah, I can do this and then not be able to do it. Yeah. But so I guess um, let's, let's uh, maybe put your uh, political science expertise into a play here. And uh, what do you think is going to happen uh, with the next election cycle? Are we going to have a Pierre Polyevra uh, as a, the leader of Canada? I think it's very possible. I think the thing is, is that uh, Justin Trudeau holds so much disproportionate power because he can call an election whenever he wants without having a vote with the governor general. Because of that, realistically, all he has to do is find a period between now um, and uh, what is it? 2025, I think it would be. Uh, between now and 2025, he has to find a point where he's ahead in the polls to call an election. So, and I don't really see from what I understand of people I know inside the NDP, I don't see the NDP voting for an election if the conservatives did like push for a vote on one. So because like, I think polling wise, and I think um, just, you know, Canada has uh, the term I used was um, the bipartisan flip flop. And since Brian Mulroney, Canada's kind of done that, where they elect a conservative for two terms and then a liberal for two terms and then maybe a little bit of variance with that. But every, you know, eight, 10 years, whatever, people tend to flip swing voters change or there's a really high voter turnout, a really low voter turnout, and it changes things. So I think if we had fixed elections in Canada, I do think Polyev would win very easily, probably, because Trudeau has been in power for so long and... That's the thing, too. I was thinking about this the other day. Like when you look at how Trudeau campaigned in 2015, he campaigned kind of like how Barack Obama did in uh, 2008. Right. um, That campaign based off hope and change and stuff. And I think right now no one wants to hear that because people feel a lot more (laughs) pessimistic because things are all cynics now. (laughs) Yeah. And when I look at housing prices back in 2015, when I like around when I was starting university versus now, it's literally doubled. Yeah. And so I just, even the middle, like upper middle class of people who have like a decent amount of money, even those people are pessimistic now, I find. So because of that, um, and Trudeau's had a million scandals too. <laughs> He's had yeah, that's like right. any other, if Stephen Harper did blackface and the SNC, like there's no way he would have survived that. But Trudeau no. got away with it. He managed, he's managed to hold his caucus together, but I think there's even a sense within the Liberal Party that this is his last election. They don't they they need to move on to something in the future. Justin Trudeau is kind of a liability to them to some degree. He's lost a popular vote twice. He's not he hasn't had that much success in terms of elections. So I think um you right, know so is he gonna step down and, and have somebody follow in his footsteps or I thought that was a possibility, but from the last I heard, he's promised to do the next election. Oh, um, but the thing with that, though, is I don't I don't know internally whether the liberals are going to just keep trying to push it till 2025 or if they're just going to accept accept it and call an election early in like um, next year, because uh, 
I think the average time for a minority government is usually like 18 months or around two years or something. Right, so yeah. it's so rare to go longer than that. And last time, I think the pandemic played a role in it lasting longer than that. So this yeah. time I don't. It's it's I'm not too sure what the liberals will do, because that's what I always say about the liberals. Like they want they'd rather lose than um, govern in a minority government. They don't right. like governing in a minority. They want to get what they want done, done. And exactly. If they can't, then they just they just as soon be the opposition. Exactly. And and that's the thing, too, because um, Harper lost, uh, Andrew Shear lost and then um, Aaron O'Toole lost. But Shear <laughs> will beat Trudeau in the popular vote. So when I look at Polyev, um, I out of the four, I do think he, he has the best chance of winning, especially because it's Trudeau has been in power so long. Yeah. But the other thing too is um when I look at things economically, that's another part of it too. Like with inflation and with um that kind of stuff, it depends on how long that keeps going on for and like interest rates and things like that. Um, because if things do start to recover, I could see Trudeau um really? calling an election and probably so, winning. Yeah, things get numbers better get better down. because everything's getting slightly better. And yeah. And in last election, when we look at like what Trudeau did, I mean, he he talked about guns a lot. About with Aaron O'Toole, he said, "Oh, Aaron O'Toole is gonna, you know, legalize AK-47s and right. that gun stuff. Really, that kind of turned things around. When it, when the Liberals went down in the polls because no one wanted an election, they went down and then they started the stuff about <laughs> guns, and then that kind of did turn things around for uh, for them. Right. Uh, uh, we've got uh, a, a first time person in my chat for uh, Genghis." Genghis Khan 233 <laughs> Aboot <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thanks for the comment um uh yeah yeah it's uh, I I remember I think back to like the Stephen Harper thing and I was I was a conservative at the time actually mm -hmm. like when he was still first coming in and and I remember the the liberal campaigns about like if uh Stephen Harper is your elected they're going to be tanks in the streets <laughs> I was like, okay, you're so over the top. I have to vote conservative now. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. This is ridiculous, but it's gone so far the other way that like, even I don't really vote now, but if I did, I could never vote conservative because it's always such, so ridiculous. Like the yeah. things they say, they don't yeah. propose any uh, like actual solutions to problems. So part exactly. of me is always very confused about how they get votes. Yeah. <laughs> Like how uh, how do you do you have an idea of how this works? Like, like, like how the conservatives get support? Yeah, I think the conservatives in Canada always kind of represent like not. I don't, I don't want to say that they're not like they're not rebellious against the liberals, but like the liberals in Canada have always been the establishment. And I think the conservatives, when people get pissed at the liberal, like, the biggest advantage conservatives have, I think. I would say is that they have a very reliable block of the vote that always shows up to vote. If there's low turnout, it always favors conservatives because they always show up to vote. They will, if they'll mm, go to work yeah, on election day, yeah. they'll show up, they vote and they do believe in voting and the electoral system. Right. And because of that, um, and if it, things hit the right spots and things like that, I, had, I think the term was a perfect storm kind of for, for a conservative to win in Canada at the federal level, it has to be a perfect storm. But when I look at uh, that, they usually just campaign off of the liberals screwing up, people wanting change. And then um, like when I look at Doug Ford and how he won the last election, the main reason he won is just because voter turnout was like historically low. Right. And his support stayed the same. He didn't get more people to turn up for him, but, but he doesn't have to. He doesn't. He doesn't need to because yeah. the, no one. The people who usually vote liberals and NDP, they just they didn't show up to the polls to vote. So he, even though he was, if he's not popular. He didn't really campaign on this time. At least last time when he did the buck a beer thing, and he had a couple catchphrases and stuff. But this time he didn't really campaign on anything. He just. He just kind of cruised his way into victory. Right. Yeah. He, <laughs> I was sure, um, there was a time not that long ago that I was sure that Doug Ford would never be able to win a uh, premier again. Yeah. Because he, 
fuck things up so bad. Yeah. <laughs> but I live in Saskatchewan, so you can never really have hope as far as I can, I'm concerned. <laughs> we got uh, good old Scotch Mo over here. Yeah. He looks so much like that guy from uh, King of the Hill. Yeah. Of the yeah. dad. Every time I see him, that's all I see is just the, the propane guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The propane guy, if he if he if he drank too much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't say anything. That's that's not fair. <laughs> but I suppose, like, do you think there's a parallel between the way that, uh, like, the provincial politics are playing out across the country and the way that the federal politics play out, or like, because it seems like there often seems like an opposite reaction in my from what I've seen. Yeah. I do think there is um, kind of a parallel there in the sense that um, like histor- like traditionally provincial turnout is always quite a bit lower than federal turnout. So that mm-hmm. does always give the conservatives an advantage usually. And then the other thing with provincial level politics is that often the conservative and liberal parties will just join together if they can't ever, if they're struggling to govern in a province, they'll usually just join together and then form one party to kind of give them an advantage. Mm. So I do think the provincial politics, especially in the last decade, it's really skewed conservative, but it's weird though, right? Because in Ontario, I remember, I don't know if it was like 15% of Doug Ford supporters, but there was, there were people who voted for Doug Ford and then they voted for Trudeau. Right. And logically that doesn't <laughs> make sense. I mean, yeah. even, even though, I mean, how different are, is Doug Ford than Justin Trudeau? In the grand scheme of things, not that different. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But the the cultural as like the cultural difference between people who usually support Doug Ford versus the cultural difference between people who support Trudeau, um, it usually wouldn't make sense because it's like, well, it, it wouldn't add up. But that's the thing, though. I, I think um, in terms of people being like rational actors, I don't think that's the way things actually usually work in like the real political world. Right. And so because of that. Um, I do think there are certain indicators at the provincial level, like the Nova Scotia election, um, how they upset the liberals, uh, how the PCs there with Tim Houston. Um, I do think across, uh, just across Canada, I do think there is kind of um, a parallel there that uh, people are upset at Trudeau and people are voting conservative or, or center right if it doesn't have, if the province doesn't have a particular like conservative with with the name in the party Mm -hmm. um i also look at bc because to me bc is going to be a really important province for whether or not pierre polyev wins and right now he's polling very well in bc and right now that's why he would probably win an election is how he'd perform in um bc so i do think there is kind of um and it's we're at a weird period too because pretty much almost Every province except for um, Newfoundland and BC is controlled by a conservative party right now. Right, and that that also does something else. But I, I the, brought up. the BC NDP are are pretty conservative. <laughs> they're, yeah, they're, they're the BC, that's the thing too. Is like I'd say the BC NDP is like very similar to Doug Ford's. Yeah, I don't see that much of a difference. Um, but I do think if at the federal level there is a kind of like thing to worry about where if Pierre Polyev did win a majority and um, the the provinces are eight out of 10 provinces are like conservative or conservative leaning governments, there could be the potential for something constitutional to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, That hasn't happened in a very long time, but that could be something um, because I think even before when Pierre Polyev was under Harper, he tried, he was involved when Harper was trying to get rid of the Senate. Mm. That is something I do support to me because either make the Senate elected or get rid of it because it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, This appointed Senate is kind of silly. It's (laughs) ridiculous. Like, like, so, but because of that though, there is kind of a relationship there with federal and provincial governments that it could be kind of a perfect storm where, now, the, Quebec's always an outlier with Francois Legault. Like that's who you you couldn't count on him to 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 do something there because like of Quebec's card. history. Yeah, with the constitution. But I do think there is that interaction as well, though. That um, if Pierre Polyev became, if he won a majority, uh, and you just have this conservative block across the country, 
Um, there is the potential that like I could see serious damage being uh, done. Yeah, I could see that. I, I see like, it seems like I know somebody, uh, some commentator was talking about the use of the notwithstanding clause and how it isn't that common, but it feels like I've heard a lot about it as conservative governments take power in various places. Like I'm sure the Saskatchewan government has talked about using the notwithstanding clause multiple times in the last 12 years or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I don't know if they actually did and have to enact it or at all, but it was, it's always on the, their, the tip of their tongue, right? They're yeah, always I think ready Doug to Ford's use it. done it twice. Well, he revoked, he did it recently and then he revoked it with the, the union stuff, but right, I think right. he's done it twice so far. Yeah. Like, so they are like always ready to just ignore the constitutionality of things in their own benefit. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, I could see a serious damage coming from like the conservatives ruling everything. Yeah. But hopefully that doesn't happen, I guess, but <laughs> that's the trouble with electoralism is that you never actually like, even when like, I have no faith in the liberals and I, ha I the NDP could never gain any power. I don't have a lot of faith in them anyway. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. So yeah, and even if they did, like when you look at BC NDP, like, right. They just turned into conservatives. Yeah. <laughs> what the hell are you supposed to do? Yeah. It's very frustrating. <laughs> but I guess we're at uh, almost 40 minutes now, so we can jump into uh, your counter propaganda if you want. Sure. So uh, for counter propaganda, you've got uh, that there has been a large amount of misinformation about the LGBT Q plus community. Mm -hmm. So I guess, uh, well, are we talking about like the, the drag, uh, yeah, <laughs> the, uh, drag story time stuff? Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, uh, it wasn't that long ago here, uh, that there was a drag time, uh, drag story time. And of course you get your right wing shitheads, uh, yeah. coming. And then we had, luckily, I mean, there was a good, counter protest against the conservative mindset. Yeah. But, uh, so, uh, what other stuff have you seen around, uh, the country for that? Well, I've seen this weird, like, it, I think it connects back to like QAnon stuff as well. Um, with this movement about the drag, uh, the, the drag story stuff, but then also just like trans people in general, there's, definitely been a moral panic recently. I know I saw in the States, like literally those like, um, like neo-Nazi guys were protesting, uh, with a bunch of weapons and stuff that's happened a bunch of times. Um, I've seen it, uh, in, uh, Ottawa that happened when I was living there, people, uh, there was a guy with a sign who was just going around like screaming about trans people at like schools. Okay. And, and people called the cops. Cops didn't do anything as usual. So the only the only way that people got them to leave and stop screaming at children is um, there was a very large counter protest of like mm -hmm. 40 people versus like this one guy. And he got in his car and, and he left. But um, when I look at that recent shooting in the States um, and how because that's the thing with Canada, too, even though like. I feel like the U S dominates our headlines so much and we don't talk about Canada enough. The problem is, is that most people in Canada watch American content. Yeah. So it's yep. like when you look at Joe Rogan, the, like most Canadians who listen to podcasts, the most common person they listen to is Ugh, Joe Rogan. Sigh. So, <laughs> but, so the thing is, is when you have people like Ben Shapiro, Tim pool, Matt Walsh, all these people, like these right wing people openly endorsing shooting and encouraging because before they tried to cover their tracks a bit before yeah. Elon bought Twitter and they, they were worried about, I think, you know, like what happened with Alex Jones, they were a little bit worried about that. Right. But that's my thing though, with Alex Jones though, is that, you know, like Ben Shapiro was part of inspiring the, the mass shooting that happened in Canada. Like the shooter in his manifesto said he, he like learned from Ben Shapiro. Right. But for some reason, like there's no consequence to that because yeah. Alex Jones got suspended, but Ben Shapiro is still, and like, that's the thing, like with young men in Canada, I know a lot of people believe that, um, a lot of people think that young people are very left wing, which is true. I think economically, 
But when you look at young people, the divide between genders, between like women, young women being very left wing, especially socially, and then young men, there's a lot of young men who are very conservative because right. they all watch Ben Shapiro, Tim Pool, and that stuff. So I think that's very concerning recently with that kind of um, propaganda that they've been putting out. And that's reached Canada so much. Like you said, like for somewhere like and for that to be happening somewhere like Saskatchewan, that um, <laughs> people are freaking yeah. out about this. Yeah. And because they all think they're independent thinkers and they all came to this conclusion themselves, but it's like they all have the same thought process. It's all at the same time. You know, I know people, I have family members, they always bring up um, this kind of stuff to me, thinking they're this like independent thinker and they've, they're they onto something. It's like, no, you just, you're getting information from T Tucker Carlson and. Right. And like Shapiro if you're so independent, how did I hear this exact wording from 10 other people yesterday on Twitter? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> this, like when I look at Canada though, that's something I would be really concerned about is this propaganda encouraging. Cause at least before they'd kind of try and distance themselves. But when you saw like what Tim pool and, uh, Matt Walsh, when they're like openly endorsing this, mm -hmm. um, I think it's very concerning, especially for places in Canada, like whether it's a gay bar uh, during Pride this year. I think that's very concerning um, when that happens this summer, because uh, I think this year there'll be a very large like counter protest to that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, there's just people. It's, so many people fly off the handle and. It, it's, it happens to people you wouldn't expect it. You know, like people I know just like bring up to me like, oh, did you hear about how uh, they're putting cat litter boxes and bathrooms in high school? I'm like, <laughs> and you have what? to explain for the thousand, thousandth <laughs> time, this is not a true thing. That's a fake thing. Yeah, like it never happened. Like it <laughs> never happened. Happen. <laughs> but it, that kind of stuff, it, um, that counter, and like we, we try and counter it on the left and stuff, but, um, it's difficult because we don't have the corporate backing. Like someone like me, yeah. someone like you, we're not getting hundreds of thousands of dollars from the, the Koch brothers or, or um, right. you know, like right wing, the Federalist Society to promote their information. So it's very hard for people like us to try and counter this because yeah. we're tr we, we try and this, but there's only so much we're capable of because yeah. most left wing content creators I know across the board have other jobs and they do content creation on the side. There's only a couple left-wing people who I can think of where it's their full-time gig and they have a lot of viewers enough to do that. Whereas yeah. like right-wing people, uh, do you know uh, Jody from uh, Imperial News podcast? Yep. Yep. Yes, yeah. Yep. So like when he talks about how it doesn't add up, how Rebel News, the right-wing network, like they're getting all these giant corporate amounts of corporate funding because they don't even have that many viewers or people who right. actually watch their stuff. So but how do they keep going? <laughs> exactly. Like how do they keep fun? They're sending reporters across the world. They have a huge crew, like 20 something people, like millions of dollars in, in payroll. It right. doesn't add up, but. I wish I had that kind of <laughs> budget. <laughs> eh? like, holy shit. Here I am. I'm thinking like if I hit $200 a month in Patreon dollars, then I'll start paying guests. <laughs> trust me i know that i know that process like it is it is, and then see that's the difficult thing with being left-wing too is so many of the people who watch my stuff they're students they're on disability yeah. whereas like the average alex jones viewer it's like okay they're like an hvac specialist and they have their own company or something so it's yeah. like that's the other hard thing about it too is like most people who are more open to left-wing especially explicitly left-wing content are usually people who are struggling themselves yeah. And it's not like um, the centrist and the right wing stuff where they, they, a lot of their viewers are very wealthy. <laughs> yeah. It seems like, wow. There's, yeah. There's a clear like separation of like class, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I, I, even like, I think of like, cause now, uh, my family, we're, we're on the upswing for like our, our finance finances after being pretty, uh, in pretty dire straits for the last couple of years. And we're going like, okay, well now we're feeling more privileged. We can, I can donate to some Patreons every night. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> I, can, I can, I can help some people around and uh, I can do some stuff, but still, it's still very limited, but, and I, I mean, I'm not a millionaire. Like there's <laughs> yeah, like, 
<laughs> Honestly, I see that. Like, I see people, they get, like, the right-wing people, they'll get, like, a $500 donation from a guy who owns, like, a construction business. Or, I mean, <laughs> who even has in 500 Canada, extra dollars? <laughs> exactly. Like, even in Canada with, um, uh, like, oh, what's that one? Um, True North, whatever. The, the really, really right-wing guy, Andrew Lawton. I've seen that there. Like, the people who give money to him and they're all connected in these circles. And then a lot of the conservative candidates themselves connect money like in the back rooms. They won't associate like Pierre Polyev himself. He's not stupid enough to go on like a super far right, but his crew and the people managing his campaign will talk to them behind the scenes and work on strategies and stuff like that. Right. Uh, we got a, a question from the comment. Uh, what do you think of Alex Stein? I'm not sure I know who that is. Do you know who that is? I don't know if I know who <laughs> Alex Stein is. A uh, comedian? <laughs> is that a left wing? Uh, sorry. <laughs> it kind of derailed us when I saw the No comment. worries. Uh, That's the thing with left wing creators too, is that it's, it's much harder for us to connect. It's so much easier for right wing people because they'll have anyone on Tucker Carlson, like Libs yeah. of TikTok, Matt Walsh. The, Tucker Carlson will show them and then they can all connect. But us it's hard for us to kind of connect to each other because Canada is such a huge country and um, it's most people, like I said, are doing this kind of like as a side thing. So yeah. there's not like one giant network or that kind of stuff. We don't have a Tucker Carlson on the news no, to promote right. all of our stuff. Yeah, that's right. Or like even Alex Jones has a huge, huge audience. He's been doing this for, 30 years or whatever yeah. the hell in whatever format it was at, I mean, 30 years ago, I was just working 60 yeah. hours a week. You know? Exactly. <laughs> I guess not 30 years ago, but like 20 years ago. Exactly. <laughs> so, but yeah, so it's, it's, yeah, we just don't. And I think there's something to the outrage machine too, right? Like they, like they focus on making each other as afraid and scared and angry as possible where I, I find that most leftist creators are trying not to do that. Yeah. Uh, they're trying to be nuanced. They're trying to come up with various uh, things that they're um, they're trying to be truthful, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is sometimes tough, but yeah. And in the conservatives, the, the moral panic that they've, um, that they can generate over anything with their control over media, local news, that stuff, print news in Canada, Toronto sun, um, the moral panic they can generate over virtually anything. Um, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to counter that because they, they control, they have so much institutional power. Mm -hmm. Um, I've, like, so many people are going to read that Toronto Sun headline about um, the school board trustee in Ottawa who's a doctor and she wanted to put uh, masks in the classroom for their, for uh, <laughs> kids and stuff. And like right. the, the amount of hate, that's local politics. That's something that shouldn't even really, maybe it could make the local newspaper. But why is it across Canada nationally, the Sun's running headlines about this across Canada national news. Right. And then that's what happened. A bunch of those far right people showed up at the school board meeting because of that. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's difficult to, to sometimes though, I try to frame it in like kind of back at them where I will say that like, there are social conservatives who want you dead. If you're a person of color, if you're oh, gay, yeah. if you're trans, like there are people who now a lot of these social conservatives, some of them are just, they're on their couch drinking beer. Yeah. They're watching Tucker, uh, Tucker Carlson and stuff like that, but they're not, Yeah, are they're they not actually the going to go yeah. out and do anything? Probably not. They're just, you know, they're viewing, but there is that like fraction of them that is extremely dangerous. And that's something that people should be, really concerned about i think yeah i think i think that's fair and uh, i mean we live in an electoral system so those people they do have a vote and they'll get off the couch to vote and yeah. then their elective uh, their their representatives they'll enact policies that take away the rights of trans people or black people or jewish people or what have you right <clears throat> so it is an issue <laughs> It is definitely something that people should be worried about. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I don't know. I always, cause part of what, uh, when I'm creating content, like when I'm doing not just, uh, interviews, I'm trying to do like a video essay, but I'm roadblocked because I want to make sure I have it as nuanced and carefully thought out as possible. But you get like Ben Shapiro sits in front of a camera for an hour, two hours all by himself, just rattling off lies. Yeah. <laughs> and then somebody has to come and debunk that stuff. So it's, it's, uh, what's that, that, uh, quote about, uh, the, a lie travels halfway around the world while the truth is still putting on its boots. Like exactly. That's a good yeah. saying. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's really hard to catch up with misinformation. Exactly. But I guess we're at 52 minutes already. So why don't we, uh, where can people find your stuff? <laughs> uh, recently I've been streaming at, uh, Twitch, uh, Adreno politics, uh, B U D R I N O. Um, like it is on the screen beside me here. Um, yeah, I've, I've done some Twitch streams for like news and different things like that occasionally. Um, and then my handle's the same pretty much anywhere. It's Bedrino Politics on pretty much any platform. And on other platforms, sometimes I'll post memes or videos or things like that occasionally when I get the time. Very cool. Is there anything that, uh, we didn't cover that you think we should talk about? Um, I think I'll just say that, like, uh, I appreciate what you're doing. I've, I've watched some of your content before and I appreciate, um, uh, I know interviewing people is a lot of work um, and like streaming and content creation. Like I was, I was having this discussion the other day, like when you're streaming like 20, 30 years ago, you had a whole crew at television guy and audio guy, um, yeah. all that stuff. Whereas now it's everything being done by one person and it's more convenient, but it's, you can create higher quality content, but it's also, it also takes a lot of work and time and effort. It's not, easy to do something especially when you have <laughs> yeah. a job and you have other things like that yeah. um so i just want to say i appreciate what you do doing this and uh it's uh and i appreciate anyone watching to um try and network with other people across i forget where i think i first found your content i want to say on twitter oh, could a while be. ago um but i think there's a lot of us like all across canada even the states or wherever in the world um where we're we want to find connections, but sometimes it can kind of be hard. Yeah. So for, for people, I, I encourage people to try and network and find, um, you know, if you like a certain content creator, see who else they talk about and things like that, because that's how me personally, I've found so many people I organize with in real life across Canada. Um, that's how I found so many different people and communities and people who are doing mutual aid and useful things like that. Um, just through a website like Twitter over the right. years. Yeah. So that's definitely that's, important. I think that's uh, if, if Twitter does collapse, that's going to be the downfall. Like that's the one thing that's going to be missed is like that opportunity to network and meet people of like-minded uh, perspectives. Yeah. And it, and it sucks with Twitter. Cause it's like Facebook is so it's so it's shit. You, you can't <laughs> use it. Like, so many people have stopped using it and Instagram yeah. does not function the same. And there, there isn't really another website that you can connect with other people. Not on the same, yeah, not on the same level. Like I'm, I'm on Mastodon and I'm on Tribal and I'm on Hive and mm -hmm. what's there? There's another one now, Post, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's another one. I'm not on that one yet, but, uh, but I guess at some point we'll see which one of these becomes more functional, which one becomes the tool that we can use. But right now, like. Twitter's been that way for a long time, so it's really it's really going to be hard to replace. Exactly. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for having me on. All right, that's all, folks. Thanks for watching and or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me survive, which is essentially the only way that projects like this can continue for me. If you want to contribute, you can do that at... Uh, patreon.com slash skeptical leftist or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical left if you can't contribute financially then a, a like on youtube or a five-star rating and a review on apple podcasts or on one of the podcast review sites like podchaser would be great if you want to find more from me then make sure to check the show notes for links to all my stuff 
and to check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. There you can find the videos I do with my friend Damien Marie Atho, and all my old content from the Brainstorm podcast, Skeptarchy, and from my newly retired show, From Ma- From Many People's Strength. You can also find links to my Discord, Reddit, and Twitch. You can contact me through my website or by emailing mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. My Twitter is at Skeptical Lefty. My Facebook page is The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. And my Mastodon is collectiva.social slash at Skeptical Leftist. Thanks so much for listening and or watching and make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website. Uh, Join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets and uh, spread the propaganda.